Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. The subject of today's episode is in the area of psychology and we're going to be looking at passive aggression and what that really is, is it has to do with how you express your anger. Do you express it in a healthy way or not? And you may not uh, think so, but passive aggression applies to everybody just as narcissism does. We are all to some extent passive aggression. The question is, is it appropriate? Is it healthy? And so true crime provides an excellent vehicle in which to test the concept of passive aggressiveness. And so we're going to be doing that in terms of the Morphew case, but only at the end of kind of a series of hurdles. We're going to define it, what it is. We're going to look at some intertextuality, uh, especially the Chris Watts case, which is a prime example of it. Then we're going to look at some of the causes of passive aggression, which I think is pretty interesting, uh, what it looks like and feels like, and then see how it may apply in the Morphew case. And then I also want to, just for practical purposes, touch on the treatment of it. Uh, you know, we've stated the problem, well, what is the solution to it? What, what does one do with it? How does one deal with it? Now, I'm sure there are some of you out there who are already getting your um, nails sharpened and you want to attack me for, I guess you, you, you might be saying, oh, I'm accusing uh, Suzanne Morphe of being passive aggressive. Um, no, this is about everyone being passive aggressive and some people being more passive aggressive than others. Um, and so you're going to understand what I'm getting at when we talk about the Chris Watts case in a moment. Obviously, if you're going to accuse me of that, my response is just uh, two things. The first is, this was brought up in a different video by a family member, right? The old passive-aggressive concept. So it's not my idea. I'm just taking it a bit further. That's the first thing to say. And the second thing to say is passive-aggressive isn't necessarily good or bad. It's like narcissism. You get some narcissism that's healthy and you get some passive-aggressiveness that's also reasonable and appropriate under the circumstances. And that's exactly what we want to look at and try to understand in this case. And it's got applicability to the more few couple, not to the one and or, or just to the one and not to the other. And as I say, you're going to get a sense of what I'm talking about when we look at that in, in reference to the, the Watts case. Before we get to today's episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So when we talk about passive aggressive personality, I think the key word is passive. What is the alternative to being passive aggressive? Well, it's being active. It's instead of taking a passive, subtle, kind of indirect role in your own emotional state, you are assertive. You are um, someone who's able to be congruent and transparent about your feelings. You're not uncertain, you're not inadequate about them, and they don't come out kind of in an explosion. There's sort of um, a gradual releasing of, of feelings, positive and negative, as is appropriate to the situation. So the definition of being passive aggressive is basically um, expressing negative feelings subtly instead of handling them directly. So it's expressing something in a sarcastic way or through a coercive way or manipulative way or through emotional blackmail. In other words, uh, in a way that is not constructive. And instead of just saying what you mean and being direct about it, you sort of uh, do it in other ways, which are actually signs of of fear and insecurity. Often we think that passive aggressive people are are rude or bullies or don't have a problem with confidence, but that is exactly the problem that they do have. In any event, by not expressing their feelings directly, 
It creates a separation between what they say and what they do. So I think to understand passive aggressive behavior, you've got to know what some of the obvious signs are. It's often bitterness or hostility. If, if someone asks you to do something, um, it might be a family member, it might be a co-worker, it might be a neighbor, um, it might be a, a witness or a suspect. If they ask to do something, they respond with hostility or bitterness. Um, I've put a link in the description to an excellent scene in the movie Fargo where the police officer enters the car dealership and starts talking to this guy and you see the changes in behavior going from being very passive and very, not subtle, but, but very um, uh, quiet in a way to being extremely um, rude and aggressive. And so that is a very good scene, just showing it. In other words, showing aggression in a passive aggressive scenario doesn't necessarily mean being violent. It just means, or it can often mean, and often does mean, that one is being almost verbally abusive, basically being unreasonably rude or unreasonably aggressive in a verbal sense after being very passive now i just want to give a an example of this just so that again it doesn't seem like i'm pointing fingers and blaming other people or standing in judgment standing above other people in judgment um i i have a relative who is the most wonderful lady um Especially as a little boy, I, I would think of her as, as just this, this wonderful lady, just um, always in, a, in a, a very good mood and just cheerful and um, interested and engaged and all that kind of thing. And then out of the blue, you know, one day sh she would just go nuts. She would just crack and... Um, you know, to be, she'd be screaming blue murder kind of thing, right? And I didn't really understand that as a, as, a, as a little boy, you know, that she was this person that you really liked being around and she was, she was super nice to everybody and very caring kind of person, very considerate. And then, um, and then there was this other side to her that it didn't come out very often, but when it did come out, it was a major explosion, and as I say, I didn't really understand it much. And if that did happen, you, you tend to, you'd be aware of it, but you tend to dismiss it as, as a one-off, but then it would happen again. And when I was a little bit older, I stayed with, with her for a short while. As I say, she was a relative. And um, that's when I kind of got a better handle on, on what I was dealing with. And um, part of it was she was married to, formerly she was married at one time to an alcoholic. She struggled her whole life with, with money. Um, she was often out of pocket and, um, you know, she was a single mother. But she, she de definitely did um, go out of her way to help other people and she was I incredibly friendly, friend, a lot friendlier than, than average. She had this sing-song voice, but... Over time, I started to realize that that was all a performance. That was all an act. That was all covering over the, the jagged edges of um, the struggle that she was going through privately. And if you caught her on the wrong day, and it could be something small, it could be just a, a chance comment that was made or whatever it was, then you could have this explosion. So out of this passivity, this overly aggressive response. And one story that she actually told that I found quite amusing, but I think explains the whole passive aggressive thing is she was, she was sleeping in bed. And um, at the time she was in a relationship with someone who um, she was not happy with um, I think there was a sense that this guy was mooching on her and this guy was a big game hunter, but I think she had the sense that he was sort of um, taking advantage of her, um, 
she was getting money from her mother and he was able to make ends meet by ensconcing himself in that situation. Anyway, long story short, one morning or early in the morning, she, she woke up just suddenly feeling very agitated about paying bills and all that kind of thing. And and apparently they at that time they still took out videos, right, at the video store. And apparently it had been his job or it was supposed to be up to him to take the videos back and pay the bill. And instead, that particular thing had, had been left undone on the dining room table. And she watched this and waited for this to be sorted out with growing anxiety and then agitation. And then eventually, as I say, she woke up one night and was becoming in sort of enraged and um, kind of furious by this whole situation. And I think another part of it was she'd asked him to go and buy bread. And instead of saying to him, when you go and buy bread, can you take these videos with and, and pay for them? And and he was also supposed to buy or, or get some medication or something. In any event, all of this sat undone on the dining room table. And that night she went to sleep and couldn't get over it. And then at some random point in the evening, she was so livid, she was so furious that she literally kicked this guy. When I say kicked him out of bed, I don't mean um, that, that she just told him to get out of bed. She literally, with her legs, um, kind of forced him off the edge of the bed in a, in a sudden motion. And, you know, he suddenly woke up thinking, well, you know, maybe, maybe she had a nightmare or something only to wake up into this fully awake, fully alert, fully conscious, enraged face, screaming at him, and, and, and um, only for him to realize, oh, this is all about this bill that I didn't pay. There is a very good example of passive aggressive. But one thing you'll notice with passive aggression is th the more, the, the greater the passivity, the greater the aggression. The, so they go hand in hand. Someone who's less passive tends to be less aggressive, right? Now, I think this relative that I've mentioned is someone who dealt with her negative feelings by putting a, a smile on it, by putting a positive veneer on it. And it, it, it made her seem like a very pleasant person, certainly when that veneer was there. But overall, signs of typically passive-aggressive people are that they are generally cynical, generally pessimistic, and often aggressive, right? Um, they frequently complain about being underappreciated or deceived. There's just a lot of um, groaning about how unfair things are. and But it's kind of within a passive context. What is interesting is it can be symptomatic of a mental disorder. So if you're passive-aggressive, it could mean there's a mental disorder, but it's not really considered to be a mental health condition. So, you know, I think there's a bit of a stigma that if you even say the word passive aggressive, that it's, you know, some kind of indictment that someone has some kind of mental problem. And I think that that is just unfortunate because, as I say, like narcissism, all of us are capable and are often to some extent passive aggressive. Because we are dealing with a little bit of a sticky problem, how do you deal with anger in a healthy way? And it's important to know the answer to that because that type of behavior can affect your ability to create and maintain healthy relationships. If you can't do that, you're going to have problems at work. So to understand passive-aggressive behavior, if you're passive, you accept what other people other people's criticisms of you you try to avoid conflict Does, doesn't that ring a bell you rarely contest or confront others right on the other hand if you're aggressive you put others down in in front of you maybe you do it on facebook or something you fueled by anger anger is often driving you through your day 
and you're just generally known to have a short fuse. And that is something that can be, um, that we've heard a little bit mentioned that that has a bearing on Barry Morphew, that it sounds as though he was someone who could get furious, certainly from Suzanne's perspective, um, that he was someone that apparently had quite a short fuse. And in some of the recordings that we've heard, where he's talking to a journalist, he sounds very uh, temperamental, intense, and certainly it sounds like he might be capable of being short-tempered and and uh, quick to anger. So how these two come together, you know, being too passive or being too aggressive is through this passive-aggressive um, dimension where you don't share your view, your honest view when asked. So, you know, how do you really feel about this? Um, and you don't, you don't do that for whatever reason. You refuse to tell people about what you're not happy about and you gossip instead behind their backs or you find some indirect way of dealing with it, but you don't confront it. You don't actually deal with it directly and that causes all sorts of problems. So in essence, there's a disconnect between what a passive aggressive person does and what they say. There's a, there's a mismatch between what they are expressing and reality and you know what they are what how they deal with their reality so in a passive aggressive scenario you might have the passive person agreeing let's say in a marriage where the spouse says can you do something and the um, passive person sounds as though they're even enthusiastic and they they, they, don't, they don't have a problem they agree but then they ultimately um, don't follow through that they don't do what they said they would do and then instead of doing that when it comes down to it um, when confronted you know why didn't you do it that's when they might express anger or resentment right does that make sense so passive aggressive people are often denying that they're angry they use sarcasm a lot they plan revenge um, of some kind they may even think about certain things they're going to say and um, they try to get them back in secret in certain ways. Now, if you're mildly passive aggressive, you may just have feelings of resentment. You may not necessarily act upon them, but you feel them and you may not, even if you feel them, you may not say anything about them. Um, another example of being mildly passive aggressive is you may act unhappy to make a point. So there's a bit of performance going on. Passive people feel like they are victims. They allow others to take advantage of them quite often. They avoid conflict at all costs and they, they just can never say no. Aggressive people yell a lot. They raise their voice a lot. They're physically uh, aggressive and they often act in anger. So let's bring all of that to true crime, back to true crime and the Chris Watts case specifically, and we're going to get to the Morphew case in due course, but the Chris Watts case is a very interesting example of passive aggressive behavior because we've got such an amazing example of an unusually passive individual in Chris Watts. He's passive, he's reserved, he's an introvert. He doesn't say when he's upset about something, he toes the line, he, he goes with the flow, he, he does what is told. When he's angry, he also doesn't say anything, and that is the problem. That is the problem. The problem is when his feelings are hurt and when he's very unhappy with something, he also doesn't communicate that, and that can lead to problems, which it did. I think what's also interesting is, on the one hand, you could say Chris Watts is very passive, on the other hand, Shanann, I think, was not. Shanann wasn't passive. But that's not to say Shanann wasn't passive-aggressive. What I do think is very interesting in the Watts example is in the Watts family and in the case of his parents and her parents, there are passive men in each instance. So in all three of those instances, 
Chris Watts, his parents, her parents, the men in that um, scenario, in that dynamic, are passive, and the women are whatever other word there is instead of passive. They are assertive, they're aggressive, they're dominant, right? And I think what that shows, certainly in the Chris Watts case and in terms of him, is that it can be very damaging to have a male figure uh, become too passive. It's important that he not be not be allowed to r- withdraw to, to, to such an extent. As I said earlier, often with um, passive aggression, the more passivity there is, in other words, the more extreme the passive side, the more extreme the aggressive side when it comes out. It's almost like bottling up. The bottling up in terms of the passive side means the explosion of aggression when it actually happens is going to be so much worse. And so what that says is one's got to learn how to express your feelings day to day, regularly, um, openly, transparently, congruently, right? I think um, probably a good comic book figure that represents passive aggression is Batman. Batman is, in his alter ego, Bruce Wayne, is this passive businessman. He's mild-mannered. He's sort of, there's no extravagance. He's um, this gentleman figure, right? But who he really is, is Batman. He's this um, violent, dark, brooding, active crime fighter. You know, he's a, is is whole persona is darkly aggressive and very active, right? And um, physical, whereas the Bruce Wayne figure is more uh, cerebral, if that makes sense. I think another good example of passive aggression in true crime are mass shooters. Invariably, you'll find that these individuals are far more passive than the norm. And they may have been bullied into passivity, meaning they may have been humiliated and scorned and undermined and insulted in to such an extent that they, they've been forced to withdraw. They don't want to withdraw, but they've been forced to withdraw. And this creates this caved-in individual who becomes more and more and more passive, eventually just experiencing a small corner of their existence compared to what they were used to. And then this bottling up starts happening, which then eventually leads to the explosion, the aggression of the mass shooting. And we've just seen that in the railway yard, I think in San Diego, I think it was there, where the person involved, a guy called Cassidy, spoke about being um, just how unfair things were. I think he said this to his ex-girlfriend or his ex-wife. Now, once again, this isn't, um, you know, validating what he's said or did by any means. It's simply showing how the psychology applies in this particular case. I think there are a couple of other cases that I feel there's a passive-aggressive element um, that are quite interesting. I think O.J. Simpson is a case in point. I think um, Amanda Knox is another case, but we're not going to talk about that uh, right now. I do think uh, it's important to stress that passive aggression is very misused. Um, it's 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 a kind of a loaded term, similar to um, narcissism. It's something that is used almost as a swear word, but it's very, um, it's it's really, it's ambiguous, it's misused. That's by experts and psychologists and, and people um, just in generally. It's, um, as I say, it is something that is true for all of us, and it just really amounts to unhealthy ways of dealing with anger. So you may not be aware, but... At one point, there was a definition that this was a personality disorder. Passive aggression was a personality disorder, and it was actually taken out of the diagnostic manual for psychologists. 
because of how often it was frequently misapplied. And it was sort of conflated with things like um, overt aggression or covert aggression, right? Covert aggression is something that is quite different. It is um, manipulation used to intimidate, to deceive, to control, to abuse others. That's covert aggression. It's a little bit different to passive aggression. Um, the when you passive aggressive, there may be a certain amount of manipulation, but it's it's certainly not as as overt and explicit as I think a lot of people misunderstand it to be. Passive aggression is essentially non-active resistance that can manifest as sullenness, stubbornness, a negative attitude, generally being in a position of opposition. And you often see it in the workplace where someone might say they're procrastinating or they're forgetful or um, you could see it in reaction to authority figures and um, in a marriage you could see it as well. So at this point we've dealt to some extent what it looks like, what it feels like, the definition, some of the intertextualities and now we're going to start bringing it into the um, into the context of the Morphew case. And how we do that is we look at what is the cause of passive aggression? Where does it come from? Is someone born passive aggressive or, or what? What is going on? And so what is quite interesting and certainly quite disturbing is that there are some very obvious contributing factors to um, passive aggression such as parenting style. You might have parents that are bullies or that are, you might, might have um, passive aggressive parents, but you could just have a style of parenting that causes the child not to want to express their feelings. Think about Chris Watts in that respect. He may have just have felt if he um, expresses himself in a certain area, gets into trouble, especially with women, and so he's not going to do that. Another one is family dynamics. Chris Watts had a, a sister who was um, quite successful in certain ways, quite functional in certain ways, and he may have felt, well, if he says something or whatever, she, she will expose him for his weakness or stupidity or whatever. And so based on a sibling, the other sibling actually withdraws, right? You might have a very um, uh, expressive, extroverted sibling, which may cause another sibling to kind of be the opposite. And then there could be other childhood influences. There could be bullies at school. There could be teachers who don't um, uh, tolerate dissent. You could have any figure that, that is like that, that doesn't tolerate dissent, but in a way that isn't healthy. So in other words, a child that wants to express um, feelings of frustration or any negative feeling is so discouraged from doing so that they eventually become maladjusted and they don't know how to do that. Another contributing factor could be religious beliefs where you feel that it's not... Uh, appropriate to not be happy about something or to be angry about something. It's not appropriate to have feelings of unforgiveness. It's not appropriate to be upset about something. And think about something like alcoholism. If a family member's alcoholism, but you're also from a religious family, how do you express that? Then there are other things like neglect. How do you deal with that as a child or even as a young adult? Just the, You don't know you're being neglected. You don't know that what you should be experiencing, you know, the, the sense of being valued is, isn't there, you, but you don't know it's not there. And so you just feel a sense of um, being worn out and, you know, you feel the cold of the wind more than, than someone from a loving family. And so this neglect 
may manifest as a kind of anger, but, but an anger that you don't know how to express. Another example is harsh punishment. If you do something wrong and, you know, all children and, and young people are capable of stepping over a line, if you do something wrong, then you're punished harshly, overly harshly. And in this area, it's easy to imagine, we don't know this for sure, but I would imagine that Barry Morphy's father was, was a bit of a, like a slave driver. He was cracking the whip with regard to his son. He wanted his son to be a baseball star, and he became a baseball star, but he, then he didn't want his son to play football. And, you know, I, I kind of get the impression that Barry's father may have been a disciplinarian and may have um, punished him harshly um, in some way when he felt it was justified. And what that can then cause is this young person that is emerging, you know, that has been punished harshly to do either the same to somebody else or to have um, a similar sense of, um, you know, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to be angry and I'm totally justified in being angry because that was done to me, right? Um, substance abuse and low self-esteem are also big parts of the passive-aggressive equation. Um, not necessarily substance abuse by the person um, that, that, that has it. It could be substance abuse from someone else. And, um, but low self-esteem is the other part of it. And low self-esteem is a weird one because, you know, if you take Barry Morphew, was he suffering from low self-esteem? No. Was Suzanne suffering from low self-esteem? You might not think so. You might think because she was this wonderful person, she didn't suffer from low self-esteem. But I've just mentioned a relative of mine who was this wonderful person that put on this amazing performance of, you know, um, looking after you and being interested and sunny side up all the time. But I, I think she suffered from low self-esteem and her husband had a substance abuse problem. I think part of the low self-esteem was also the moneylessness and, and other things. But there was definitely that at the heart of it. And one wonders whether Suzanne didn't struggle with low self-esteem to some extent reinforced by her beliefs. And so, you know, Jesus loves me, but you know, I'm not going to give voice to these things that I'm not very happy about. You know, if my husband doesn't love me or if my husband's cheating on me, I'm not going to tell anyone about it. I'm not going to confront him about it, Right. And that's the passive voice. Again, you can look at the Watts case and say, you know, there's a time where Shanann was actually aware that, uh, or she suspected that her husband was cheating on her, and she then went into a, a, a passive role. She was quite passive in dealing with that, and, and at great cost, because as she became passive, he came out of his own passivity and did something incredibly uh, aggressive, something that was basically um, a total aberration in terms of violence, you know, in terms of his own family. To fully appreciate the passive-aggressive thing in the Watts case, one's got to look at the phone data review and take Shanann's own words where she talks about, you know, I'm struggling with, ev it's taking everything I have not to flip out, not to explode all over Chris Watts and and scream at him because of the way that he's treating me. And as I say, she's retreating into a passive role. He also became very passive, very quiet in the last two weeks um, before the incident, which I think is quite interesting. He became more and more standoff, standoffish. That's also what Scott Peterson was said to have done, becoming standoffish. Standoffishness is a is an analogy for passivity. And so you've got to be careful with someone who's becoming standoffish that that a, a, a time bomb hasn't started ticking in their hearts and minds. So just a couple of signs you're dealing with a passive-aggressive person. They, they may leave things undone. They may not 
pay certain debts. Uh, you've got to ask them again and again to do something. They may, may be running late. They may be, be um, um, giving a non-compliment, meaning they say something, but it's not really a compliment, right? A passive-aggressive person will often say things like, I don't want to sound mean, but I hope you don't think I'm insensitive, but not to be judgmental, but... You're going to hate this, but, um, you know, all of that kind of thing. I think one of the key symptoms of passive aggression is when they are upset, there's silence. And it's a tense silence. Nothing is said. And you can imagine that happening in the Morphew home. You can imagine when Suzanne was upset, there would be silence. She would give Barry the silent treatment. And probably vice versa, I think Shanann Watts was experiencing that with her husband. He became, as quiet as he was, he became even quieter. So probably you've recognized some of your own issues with anger and possibly with someone else's anger. And you might be wondering, what do you do with that? Because everyone has it. It's, it's ubiquitous. And there are a couple of things that you could do. Practice assertive communication. Make room for dissent. Allow someone else to disagree with you. Um, face the fear of confrontation. So if you are afraid to confront someone, just think about it. Don't be afraid to sit with that, that idea. And, and you don't have to confront in an aggressive way. You can confront in an assertive way. Simply just communicating where you come from. Also call out the behavior when you see it. Call out something when you feel it's appropriate to you, not what you think is appropriate to somebody else. I think um, a treatment that a lot of people would not think about is exercise, is that you've got pent up emotions in your pent-up anger and a good way of expressing it may, may not be to express it in, in other words in words or in some kind of explosion but what if one channels those some of those feelings into exercise right I'm certainly not saying you know if someone um, uh, steals your car that you then put on your jogging shoes and, and, and go for a run. I'm not saying that at all. Or if you um, find that your husband has, um, you know, eaten a candy bar that you left in the refrigerator that, that you'd been waiting to eat all weekend or finished the last little bit of milk in, in, in the refrigerator, that you then, you know, go and exercise. I'm saying that... I think exercise is a good way of modulating those emotions just in an average way because it is a way that you can express yourself. You can express some of those aggressive feelings through, um, through exercise, through intense activity. And that's a constructive way of converting some of those negative feelings into a positive outcome. It also gives you some perspective on yourself. Now, in the, uh, I think it was the interview room, they were saying that Suzanne was passive aggressive. And what I, what I think, what I understand that to mean was that she was inclined to be passive most of the time. I think if she was aggressive, it was, it would tend to be something like being, being silent um, or saying something in a, perhaps a sarcastic way, occasionally, right? She may have expressed her anger um, occasionally as well, but I think it basically means she was mostly passive. And she would then become sometimes aggressive with, with Barry, upset with Barry, when there were certain issues like him not paying for a loan or other other potential issues but I think often a way of dealing with it would have been through silence and what does silence do what can silence do what's the subject of the previous episode it can isolate you 
What also came about in that last interview was Melinda saying that my dad was very worried about her making this move to Colorado. And he was right. She was 26 years in remission. It's possible that the passivity that she had, the bottling up of these feelings that she had, it doesn't mean she didn't have feelings. She did. That may be a possible um, aggravator of her getting cancer by pushing these destructive negative feelings under the surface. They then manifest physically as cancer, something to think about. It's also something to think about, and you're probably not going to want to hear this or like to hear this, but the text that Melinda receives from her sister, she res her response to that is quite passive. Right, It's something that r did require, I think the appropriate response was a response, wouldn't you say? She also said that the finances put Suzanne in a pressure cooker with Barry. And what this would have done is intensify that whole loop of passive aggression between both of them. Because he's not paying back what he said he'd pay back. And so in the context of true crime, when a crime happens, especially murder, that is the extreme version of aggression. And what you typically see in true crime is on the other side of that aggression is passivity. And what is that passivity? Anger. It's anger that is misdirected. It is anger that is not expressed. And it's not expressed because there's a fear of expressing it. And so ultimately, how is that fear expressed? Well, through the murder. How is that anger expressed through the murder? And so again, if true crime teaches us anything, especially with regard to this topic, learn to express your anger. Don't deny that you're angry and don't bottle it up and don't wait to express it. As it happens, try and communicate it without being sarcastic, without being subtle, with, without any manipulation, without raising your voice, saying in a measured way, saying reasonably, this is upsetting to me. This is actually making me angry, right? And the person on the receiving end, allow dissent. Don't discourage it. Don't control it. Listen to it. And if you take that whole topic of conversation and you take it into the wider society, I think we are becoming quite a passive-aggressive society. There's the, the tyranny of political correctness. And there's also this tyranny of where, you know, if you have a, a something that you want to say about another person, whether it's a slur or something, um, there are certain people that probably are racists. There are certain people that probably are a certain way, and I know this is controversial to say, but if you don't allow that dissent, what you're doing is you are forcing a degree of passivity. You're forcing it underground, and what then happens, you're not going to get rid of it. It's going to emerge in some other way in a much worse form. And so I'm certainly not saying allow people to make negative, horrible, racist statements all the time. But I'm saying there should be a certain level of tolerance for dissent. And how you actually allow that, well, that's the question. It's difficult. But you can't have no dissent. You've got to allow a certain amount of dissent. So, in other words, to bring the passivity down, you are going to bring the other side of it down as well the aggression. Does that make sense? So I think you can agree that this is a very important conversation. It's a very interesting conversation. It's not necessarily very easy to deal with either in yourself or in other people. But as a safety valve, what is important is to allow that valve to open, whether with yourself or with people around you. It's quite important to be aware if there is underlying anxiety or tension because that is what is going to drive these feelings. 
So another way of dealing with it is to, to deal with the source. What is causing these feelings of disquiet and discontent? And I think those driving forces in the Morphew case were difficult to, to deal with. I think they were foundational. It was to do with Barry's backstory and, and um, also to some extent um, Suzanne's cancer battle and the extent to which she'd made herself second, right? Um, in the same way that Chris Watts did in a way. She made herself second, deferring always to Barry, letting Barry get his way. But then Barry doing certain things perhaps that that weren't the the sort of things a hero does, right? And then what do you do with that? How do you confront that? What do you do with your anger then, right? How do you express your anger to a bully? How do you express your anger to someone who has a short fuse? This has been a long episode. I'm not going to take it further than this. I hope you found it interesting. Tomorrow I'll be doing a live stream at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on um, commoditization. So look out for that. And then on Sunday we'll be talking about Five crucial mistakes made by Rob Hall in the 1996 Everest disaster. That's Sunday, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. On Patreon, there are a couple of different series. There's uh, the TCRS, TCRS Presents series on John Bonet Ramsey every Tuesday. On Wednesdays, we do Laurie Vallow. And then Thursdays or Fridays, uh, the Ripper Investigation. All of those are on the $3 tier. There are audiobooks on the $5 tier and $10 tier narrated by me as well as analysis, ongoing analysis of uh, various court cases. We've just looked at Molly Tibbetts. Uh, a verdict has just come out there where Rivera has been found guilty. Also the Durst case, uh, Madeleine McCann and so on. So if you're interested in true crime generally, then become a patron at patreon.com slash TCRS. Thank you for listening. Enjoy your weekend. Watch out for that anger. Make sure that you are expressing it in an assertive way. And I'll see you guys next time.